Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as a crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things, and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and they may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and mortars, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add, to, add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, it's been about a year we've been in Revelation. Obviously, I didn't preach it every Sunday. I uh, took a few breaks there. But uh, here we are. And I don't know if your Bible says it, but mine says the end, those two little words at the end there. So I don't know if those are inspired or not, but certainly certainly there it is, the end of the book, the end of Revelation, the end of the revelation of God to us at this time, Old Testament and New Testament. Here we are. In Revelation 22, we'll just get right into it. Look at verse 1 there. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. First thing I noticed there is that word pure. I stumbled over the definition a little bit uh, last week, and so I went and grabbed it. Near the end of Revelation is when you start hearing this word. A little bit earlier in Judgment, uh, it talks about angels wearing pure linens as they come out to pour out the plagues of God's wrath. Pure simply means not mixed with any other substance or material. Free of contamination, nothing but the water of life here is pouring down this river. It's 
pretty amazing to think about that. Water of life. Is it going to be, you know, two, two uh, hydrogen, one oxygen? I don't know if that'll be the makeup of it, but certainly it's, it's pure. There's nothing else in it. Water of life without contamination. Something to think about. And, you know, we often take a drink of water and there's a taste to it. And, you, you know, everybody wants to have a taste of their water from maybe their home taps or, or they remember what grandma's water tasted like from the well. Or, you know, maybe if it is from the well, it's that he's got that little bit of sulfur smell into it. If you're, you know, from a certain city, maybe there's a fluoride taste to it. Who knows what it is? But nevertheless, God is pouring out this pure water of life available to us. <clears throat> now, I mentioned uh, in second... Um, I mentioned previously in Revelation, and you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Keep your finger, of course, there in Revelation 22. I mentioned previously that I thought this water of life was indicative of the Holy Spirit and His presence there in New Jerusalem. I think there by type, you still see that John chapter 7 and verse 37 through 39 uh, brings that to, remember, it's talking about Jesus when He talked about pure river or pure water and he says but this he spoke of the holy spirit and so by type perhaps that's what it's indicating but there's another possibility of who the holy spirit is here in new jerusalem if you go to second corinthians chapter one and look at verse 22 it says who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I come not unto you as unto Corinth, not for that we have not dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Okay? So this is talking about standing in the faith that we have, and when we stand in the faith of God and of Christ, he gives us what it says in verse 22, that earnest of the Spirit. And an earnest is simply a down payment. It's a portion of the whole that's given. If you want to go and buy a car, you'll often put down earnest and come back a little while later and start making payments. And so it is possible then that we have, when we're saved, the earnest of the Spirit, and one day we will be paid in full. Therefore, what's going on when we're all in heaven is that we will have the fullness of the Spirit simply abiding in us. Sure, by type, you have the water of the Word, you have the water of that Spirit, but it's perhaps that the Spirit is just equally spread abroad in fullness in each and every believer at this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you can turn over, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life so this tabernacle that it's talking about this house that it's talking about is our our, our risen and resurrected body Certainly now we desire that mortality or, or that thing in us that makes us um, die, essentially, that makes us mortal, that makes us the opposite of immortal. We want that to be swallowed up by the life which Christ offers. Now we feel naked. Now we groan, you know, sometimes just because of pain, sometimes because of hardships and struggles that we have when we're in this flesh. Look at verse 5. It says, Now he that hath wrought us for the same self thing is God. Who hath also who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. There it is again, the down payment of the Spirit. We have a portion of the Spirit given unto us. Verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So obviously currently we are now absent from the Lord in our bodies, subject to mortality, subject to the pains and the sufferings that go along with that. But one day, we will be absent from this body, present with the Lord. And I believe, potentially, that's the time where we're going to get the fullness of the Spirit given to us. Not just the down payment anymore. Uh, go back to Revelation chapter 22. Now, in dealing with this water, the Bible refers to it as being offered as a gift. It says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it was in the previous chapter where he talks about it being given and offered 
freely then. Talks about it being clear as crystal. There's another good definition. When something is pure, something is clear. It doesn't have anything in it that would make it uh, cloudy or, 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 diff or different throughout or a mixture. The Bible records it as proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's where this river of water is going to proceed from. Of course, something coming from God and from His throne, it's got to be pure. It's got to be clean. It's got to be holy. There's got to be no spot nor blemish in it. And so God provides that thing, that gift freely. The Bible records then in 21 and verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. There it's a gift for us provided once we arrive in heaven, once we have the fullness of the Spirit, once we have put off mortality, we will have access to this gift of the water of life, and we will enjoy that for all eternity. Now continue down into verse 2 and read with me. It says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Keep your finger there. Ezekiel chapter 47. If you ever wondered about the end of Ezekiel, if that's actually talking about... You know, because you get into this time when it's talking about a, a, a temple being made and built up. Is it going to be erected in Israel in the last days, or is this something heavenly and afar off? Well, as you get to the end, it starts to become more and more clear that Ezekiel here in chapter 47 is talking about the heavenly city that we will once behold, one day behold. Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, there's a lot of material here referring to what we just read in Revelation 22 and verse 2. Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, it says, And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat. So meat is food. Meat is provision. So it's good news for Baptists. There's going to be food in heaven. There's going to be fellowship. There's going to be eating. There's going to be all of that. You know, we don't just eat food for our health down here, right? Of course. But we'll actually have food to eat. It says then, Whose leaf shall not fa fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. So that talks about Psalm chapter 1 and verse 3 where it says, the, the righteous, he that abideth you know, with God and falls not after unrighteousness, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's a promise we can achieve and, and absorb and, and have for ourselves today. It's also a prophecy of what's to come. An unwithering tree bringing forth fruits in his season. Ezekiel 47 verse 12, it continues on. It says, It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So, new fruits according to his months, and leaves for medicine is what it refers to here. Now go back to Revelation 22. In verse 2, it talks about this. It says, Yielded her fruit every month, new fruit according to his months, is what it records in Ezekiel 47. And so I think that's telling us that it's going to be, you know, the month of this fruit. And then that kind of fades away. And then the next month, a new fruit comes upon it. And then that fades away and is consumed. And then the next month, there's another fruit that comes up never actually being fully consumed and, and, and having lack thereof, but it will be giving us a time frame. And that's another thing that kind of is shocking because the Bible says in one place there should be time no more. And some people say, oh, but that's because it's eternity and that's because, you know, we just will not have days, months, years or anything like that. It will be irrelevant. But this actually indicates that there will be some sort of time frame given and we will see that based on what month, what fruit? Those will line up. This is the month of this fruit. This is the month of that fruit. And so we'll have some sort of tell of the time that's to come. Healing of the nations, it says, the leaves shall be. So healing, that's a good question. To ask. Why would there be healing? In a place where Revelation 21 and verse 4 says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. In a time when there is no harm or hurt or tears, 
how can there be healing? You have to be harmed in order to find healing, don't you? Doesn't there have to be something that, that happens to somebody that brings them to a state of needing healing? Well, it says here that the leaf is the healing of the nations. And so it, it seems then that there will be a group known as the nations that will still be subject to things that they need to be healed from. Perhaps now this, these haven't achieved you know, a perfect body or immortality. I don't know what it is, but for some reason, these nations need healing. Certainly not God's people, certainly not those that have been given a glorified, resurrected body, but these nations certainly need healing for something and from something. Okay, go to verse 3 now. 22 and verse 3, it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So no more curse. Gen Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Keep your finger. Go to Genesis 3 verse 17. This is the conclusion of the whole of the scripture. So you'd expect a lot of loose ends to come and be tied at this point. Way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17 is when you first hear of the curse. Obviously we all know the story. The woman took of the forbidden fruit and did eat and when she ate, her eyes were open, giving to her husband. His eyes were also open, and they were both naked, made fig trees of their own works to cover themselves. They fell at that moment. They sinned against the holy God. Verse 17 of Genesis chapter um, 3 records, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken." For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So the curse here then is, is pretty clear. There will be a sorrow in eating of the fruit. Why? Because now you've got to go out and in the sweat of thy brow, collect that fruit. You have to plant it. You have to wait for it to grow and nourish it. You have to harvest it. You have to bring it in. In sorrow, you will have to, Adam, take upon yourself this curse. And you will have to provide for yourself in the sweat of your own face. To add insult to injury, there will be thorns and thistles now that you will suffer as you try to go about and perform this work. What a curse that is that was put upon us. And I believe that's the curse then that is removed now when we get back into Revelation chapter 22. There will be no more labor by the sweat of thy brow. You will not have to go out and work and toil and sorrow in order to eat. Now, does that mean there will be no work there in heaven? No, I don't believe that at all, because the end of verse 3 says, Very clearly, his servants shall serve them. His servants shall serve him, sorry. Meaning that there will be a servitude in heaven. Men who are his servants, women who are his servants, the servants of God, shall serve before him. Now, I'm thankful because serving God won't be anything like serving your earthly bosses or, or, or ladies serving your husbands or, or, uh, or, or submitting one to another. Rather, serving God is, is probably one of the most easy yokes to put on you. Jesus himself said, take my yoke upon you. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. In other words, taking upon yourself the labor of God is not something that is difficult, that is sorrowful, that is a struggle, that is something that pricks you with thorns and thistles. There's no more curse there. We'll be, we'll be absolved of that. We'll be free of that. Having access then to the tree of life, which yields fruit that shall never be corrupted, that shall never run out. Verse 4, it says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. So, Previously, the Bible records many places, no man shall see his face and live. But here very clearly in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, you'll see his face. Your name shall be in their foreheads. His name shall be in our foreheads, recorded forever, marked as the servant of Christ. Verse 5, it says, and there shall be no night there. 
And they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So with no night, with no sun, only God himself being the light, it's given to us. Him, himself, he is the light that lighteth all men at this time. Again, you have to wonder, how then do we measure time? Okay, then there will be time no longer because we measure now sunrise, sunset. But that's where that monthly yielding of a fruit will give us that, that time. It's going to be interesting, I think, to see that. That no longer will we, you know, sun up, sun down. It's a new day. Sun up, sun down. You know, we get rest when the sun is down. But rather, I don't think we'll need rest if we're eternal, if, we're, if we have, you know that eternal body and no need of those perhaps all we need to do is look over find out what month it is and that will be our frame for time here in eternity verse 6 it records and he said unto me these sayings are faithful and true and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants things which must shortly be done now this phrase comes from, and again, closes out the book of Revelation, pointing back to Revelation chapter 1, when it all began. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 records the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things which he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I love that verse 3 records, He that readeth, they that hear, those that keep the things which are written in this book. Read them, retain them, do them, lay them up in store. Heed these things, keep them, and be blessed. God clearly indicates a promise made then to the book of Revelation also, I believe the scriptures that whole just encompass that promise. If you read these books, if you absorb these scriptures, if you keep these sayings, you will be blessed. Back in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6, faithful and true. You can count on these words. The Lord, the God of the holy prophets, sent to show his servants the things which must shortly be done. And I'm so thankful he did. The Bible records actually from the time of Christ on is the last days. Certainly now we're even closer to the last day than he was back then. And yet all the while men had this expectation of Christ coming soon. And is it just because they're all, you know, uh, they got that, um, you know, Jesus could come at any moment mentality? No, not necessarily with an understanding of the scripture, but there is an expectancy when Christ says things like, I'm coming quickly, we don't think of 2,000 years as quickly, do we? Nevertheless, in the big scheme of things, in the framework of eternity, 2,000 years is quickly. And here we are, about 2,000 years from when Christ had these things recorded by his angel sent to his servant John to pen it so that we can now read it today. We're certainly more close now than he was then, but the same promise is made. Behold, verse 7, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. That promise remains to this day as eternal in heaven as Christ himself. You can bank on that promise, receive that promise, be blessed by keeping the things that are written and recorded here. Christ is coming quickly, amen. And when you think with that mindset, even though we know certainly there are things that will come to pass before that, we have the heart that is expecting God at any moment. And we also shouldn't be shocked by that. It's not, it's not wrong to be um, expecting God to come at any moment. I sometimes say to people, you know, you can be pre-trib, that's fine. Because in reality, a lot of us are, you know, we're all in that same boat in, this, in the sense of this. You could go out and get hit by a car and then Jesus could come at any moment. We are all just one breath away from him coming right so just because maybe i don't agree with this camp and this camp doesn't agree with me about 
how revelation plays out, we're all in the same boat where we're one breath away from facing Christ. We're all one breath away from going on into eternity and either being blessed or being cursed by being in the presence of God. Behold, I cometh quickly is the promise Jesus made. And for any one of us, at any particular moment, Jesus could come. Verse 8, it continues. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Here again, an angel is being referred to as brethren by himself and being referred to as a prophet like unto yourself. So many embarrassing moments you find in the scriptures where somebody falls at their feet before a glorified saint. It makes you wonder how awesome is our visage, our appearance, our likeness going to be when we're glorified. That an earthly man like John, who's a great Christian, who's actually seen angelic revelations in his life, who's been through many trials and tribulations and seen the miracles of God, literally rested his head on the bosom of Christ. A guy like John looks at a glorified preacher, a glorified saint, a glorified, just maybe he was just a dad. Maybe he, you know, maybe he didn't do things too great. Who knows who this man is? But nevertheless, he sees him and just his appearance and the words that he's saying causes him to fall before him in worship. Nevertheless, he says, no, 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 no. Don't worship me. I'm of thy brethren, the prophets, and them which keep the sayings of this book. I'm nobody. I'm only somebody who's heard the words, passed them on to you. I keep the words. I followed the words. I believed on Christ to the end that I am saved. But worship God. Don't worship me. Still, it's, it's fun to think about what we would look like when, when our visage, when we're glorified, would, would cause our brethren who are here on this earth to fall to their knees and, and try to worship us. Nevertheless, compared to Christ, compared to God, we, we will be nothing. We will be humble enough to admit, hey, worship God. Don't worship me, lifting them up onto their feet. Now, verse 10, it says this, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Keep your finger in Revelation 22. I'm going to take you to Daniel chapter 12. And you're going to see a contrast between the Old Testament prophecies and revelations and the New Testament. Now again, I don't need to tell anybody, it's not some big revelation, that a book like Ezekiel is pretty confusing. Okay, for somebody to just open up and read it and try to understand everything that's going on in there. There's a lot of things in there that are hard for us to understand. The same is true about the end of Daniel. And here in Daniel chapter 12, we're given revelation as to why. Now remember, the angel told John in the book of Revelation, seal not the prophecy of this book, the time is at hand. Here in Daniel chapter 12, there's a completely different exchange. And it says in verse 1, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now if you think about what we've learned in Revelation, there's a lot of time that's in in encapsulated by that one verse talking about a great time of tribulation and deliverance that comes how many plagues led up to that time of tribulation there's, there's a great window of time that's just simply mentioned here in passing by michael verse 2 says and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt again there's whole chapters referring to that revelation here in daniel Verse 3, and it says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. Look at this in verse 4, though. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased and so the promise in revelation was seal not this book and here daniel is being specifically told to seal up the book shut up the words that are here seal that book even unto the time of the end in other words this isn't for your time daniel it's for a time to come 
Continue on in verse 5. And I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time and times and a half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Did you catch all that? And I heard, but I understood not. Oh, don't worry if you didn't. Because even Daniel's here getting revelation from Michael the angel himself. And he says, I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He's going to ask the same question basically in a different way. Verse 9, and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. The same answer comes back to him. These things are closed up. These are sealed. These are not for you to understand. And Daniel's maybe a little bit perturbed because he wants to understand, but he might be a little bit relieved because he's like, that's fine because I really just don't get it. Verse 10, many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days, but go thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So it just kind of occurred to me, and maybe this is just a fleeting thought, but could it be that the very angel that is standing now before John is Daniel himself, now giving the fullness of the revelation, as he explains to him, you know, worship, you know, I, I came and brought these things by the prophecy. Um, you know, I fell down to worship before the angel was what John did. And he said, you know, stand up. Then he gets to deliver perhaps that message. Seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Daniel, back in Daniel 12, was told, shut it up until the end of time. He was told, go thy way, for thy words are closed and sealed up until the time of the end. He says, go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Could be, it could be that Daniel here now is getting that opportunity to open the book and to give understanding, even as I can read Daniel and get all confused and mixed up and not have a clue what he's talking about. But when I suddenly open the unsealed book, that sealed book back there makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? Suddenly you're reading Daniel chapter 12 and something that is very brief, something that is very vague, comes to clarity because you have many words in the book of Revelation that give you more insight and more explanation. And now Daniel is not the only revelation because it was sealed up. It was difficult to understand. It was way back then in a time long before. Now at the last days we have more understanding because there's more revelation and we have this actual book called the book of Revelation, which I believe the purpose of it is to unseal all the prophecies that were written aforetime. Seal not the saying of this book. And here in the last days, this book is unsealed for us. And amen, the time is at hand. Revelation 22 and verse 11 continues. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Still, now to this day, we still go as a church and individually, knowing the terror of God, trying to persuade men. But you know, doesn't it seem lately, and I've, I've talked with some of the brothers here before, I've been getting the gospel out more than I did before. More people seem receptive to hear the gospel, but a lot less actually are receptive to obey the gospel and believe on Christ. It's, it's interesting because at the last days, the promise was made, the gospel of the kingdom shall go forth and then shall the end be. It doesn't say that many people are going to be saved at the last day, but simply the gospel will go forth. And I've been experiencing that, honestly, just in my observations. More people will let me get front to back in the gospel and outright reject it than I've ever experienced in my life. I've never had people so receptive to hear and then reject it. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine, and he was experiencing the same thing in Kansas City. 
And he said, my guys go and they're getting the gospel out. He's like, but it's shocking how many people we may be making reprobates. We're giving the gospel to people. Clearly they're understanding and they're saying, no thanks. Now, of course, we can't tell that that's the last time and the final straw, but certainly every time somebody hears and rejects and hears and rejects, they're getting closer and closer to that final curtain call where God says, no, enough is enough. I've told you, I've warned you once, twice, three times, however many times. And I don't think it's a, a finite number. I think that it's different for everybody, depending on the hardness of their heart and the, and the strength of the revelation that came. They knew God, but they glorified him not as God. And how many times have I recently been able to go and have people know God, but in the end not glorify him as God? It's shocking. It's scary, but this is the last days. And, and, and these types of things that we read in the book of Revelation, more and more and more, we're going to see these things coming to pass. The end is now. The time is at hand. And we go and we warn and we persuade men, but he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. What can you do? You can't, I've told people this. I even actually got in trouble with the law one time. I had the police call them because I, I tried to use the illustration. You know, I could, I could twist your arm behind your back and hold you down and give you a noogie, you know, and, and make you believe on Christ, but it doesn't work that way. You have to buy your own free will. Of course, a noogie is not really that violent of an act, but nevertheless, I had the police called upon me by, because he was, he was a teenager or something, and he went and he got saved. He, he said he believed on Christ, and I think he went home and tried to testify to his parents, and they weren't having it. And then it was one of these things where he said he'd give you a noogie? And so I had to explain, to explain to the police officer. I actually started giving her the gospel, and she's like, yeah, I don't want to hear that. But over the phone, I was explaining. I'm like, it's just an illustration of free will. You know, twist your arm, give you a noogie, wrestle you to the ground, force you to believe. It's just a, a turn of phrase that helps people understand. But we're not going to be able to do that. So we just have to be resolved that we give the gospel. The unjust, let them be unjust still. Those that are filthy, let them be filthy still. Him that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And let's hope for that. He that is holy, let him be holy still. It, it's almost just saying like, hey, there's going to come a time where lines are drawn. You're either one or the other. You're going to believe or you're not. You're either on your way to heaven, a child of the king, or you're on your way to hell, a child of the devil. No in between. It's an interesting thought there. The time is nigh. We need to get the gospel out there. Verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give unto every man according to his work shall be. So be rewarded by being encouraged, be encouraged to gather rewards by doing exactly that, going and prophesying, going and preaching, going and encouraging others to believe on Christ and to receive of that same reward. God's coming quickly. The time is at hand. We're, we're, not, we're on borrowed time at this point, I believe. It's just a matter of time before things start winding down in the way of the world and they start winding up in the way of the last days and the judgment of God that will fall. Verse 13 continues and says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. And you indeed are blessed to enter in. How do you enter in? Doing his commandments. What is his utmost of commandments? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly there's blessings that come and you're offered access by doing according to God's will. His reward is with him. He's going to give according to every man, what his, according to what his work shall be and reward us in these last days. And once the final curtain draws and, you know, we breathe our last breath and we're glorified, we will receive of that reward. But the opposite is also true. Verse 15, for without our dogs... So you want to be blessed, of course, to enter in through the gates of the city, have right to the tree of life. Without our dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, and certainly anybody in that category had the opportunity to be blessed, enter in through the gates of the city, have right to the tree of life, but at some point they decided, hey, I'm going to be unjust still. At some point they decided, I'm going to be filthy still. I'm going to be a dog. I'm going to be a sorcerer. I'm going to be a whoremonger. I'm going to be a murderer. I'm going to be an idolater. They made their decision to not believe on Christ. This is his commandment, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Continues on in verse 16. 
I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in what? The churches. A lot of people will say that, you know, at Revelation 4, that's the last time you ever hear of the church. Therefore, that was the rapture back in Revelation 4. Now, if you go back, I think when we were teaching that and we were preaching on that earlier, we dealt with the fact that this just could not possibly be the rapture of the church. Now, it doesn't, yes, say the word church until now, but it's a pretty strong indication that what's been written from here back was specifically for the churches. And why would God write a book to people that don't even need to worry about it or hear it or see it? No, it's for the churches. And when you read Revelation from here back to four, you're going to find not church mentioned, but saints, but faithful, but believers, like all those terms that also indicate saved Christians, believers on Christ. We can continue on. This is to the churches, verse 16. And really, who else would it be for? The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. God used his church and ordained his church in order to get his will performed on this earth in the New Testament era. God ordained these bodies of many with many spiritual gifts to come together to fulfill his will, to spread his truth, to be the rock-solid pillar and ground of his institution here in this world. And so, of course, he comes and he testifies using a book like Revelation and everything else, specifically to the churches. Makes the statement, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. More indication of him just being the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He says he's both the root and the offspring. How are you both the root and the fruit of a tree at the same time? You can't be unless you're God, unless you're Jesus Christ. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Freely offered to everybody, whosoever will. Here's a, come unto me, all ye that labor. Come unto me. Final invitation. God uses the final few passages of the Bible to give another invitation to come. Come unto me. Come. If you're a thirst, come. Take of the water of life freely. Don't delay. Don't wait. There's no more time left. The last pages of the book God uses to say, come unto me. A final invitation to the world. Come. A final warning even to the religious is given here. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written therein. Why is that a warning then to the religious? Because nobody who's secular is really handling this book much. The ones I believe that are most in danger of taking the word of God, using it deceitfully, adding to it, removing from it, are religious folks. People that are going to stand as in Matthew chapter 7 and say, Lord, Lord, have I not in thy name made many wonderful translations? Have I not in thy name taken your word and tried to make it more simple to this group of people? Have I not taken your word and dumbed it down into a comic book form? You know, people that are handling the word of God deceitfully are your preachers, are your scholars, are your religious folks by and large. And the warning here is very clear. Add not to the sayings of this book, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. But worse than that, lest he take the plagues written in this book and cast them upon you. Lest he take your name out of the book of life from the holy city and the things which are written in this book and you be rejected. Lord, Lord, have I not in thy name done many wonderful works? Christ will profess unto those in that day, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. <clears throat> As always, here's our invitation to our Savior. Verse 20, He which testifieth these things saith, that's Jesus, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. And I think every day, every, once in a, every day, you know, at least once in a day, I think to myself, even so come quickly Lord Jesus. 
You know, things in this life aren't always fun, aren't always simple, aren't always comfortable. Won't it be a wonderful day when Christ comes and we won't have to face death, tears, sorrow, crying, no more pain. All of those things are just daily occurrences in our lives. We lose people that we loved. You know, we get hurt. We face sadness. Our feelings are hurt. All sorts of things that happen in this life that are not so fun. But Christ testifies even to you today, surely I come quickly. Look forward to that. Expect that. Say back to him, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. Always expecting, always anticipating the time when you will get to see Christ. Even if you believe that there's other things, prophetically speaking, that need to happen before that day comes, hey, you could face Christ today. It could be your last day today. It's what we tell people at the door to try to bring them to urgency, to try to draw them in and say, come, 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 come. Finally, the end, the final revelation to us is made. And we may not know everything. And of course, I admit that I didn't touch everything. I don't even know everything. I, I don't understand everything that this book reveals. Certainly, I can probably go in 10 years from now, do another series through Revelation. And, and a lot of my viewpoints will be different. Maybe I'll understand some things more. Maybe I'll have to completely change my mind on some things, given the state of the world. But this book is timeless. This book is, every time I read it, it just, it just gives me more. Every time I read it, it changes my mind just a little bit. Every time I read it, it opens my eyes and gives me understanding that I never had before. This book plays a special role in my heart. Revelation 19 was the book that I was reading when I finally repented of my unbelief and, and, and knew I was on my way to hell and asked Christ to save me. This book is special to me, and I've enjoyed going through it. And here it is, though, the end, right? But before the end, before the finality, there's this one more statement. It's like John just wants to give one last word. He said, I, John, saw these things. He says, I, John, beheld these things. This is the same John that put his, his head to Jesus' breast. He says in verse 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's what I want people to have more than anything. If there's one thing that I would want people to have, one final word, may the grace of God be with you. We use that acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense, that, that gift that you didn't earn. Right? The last words that he says is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The last thing that he wants to say before closing the book of Revelation is may God's grace be with you. Come, take of the water of life freely. Receive of that free gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. May you have it. Will you have it? Accept it. Believe on him. Trust him. Receive him today. God wants everybody to receive of his grace. If you've received of his grace, hey, get some more of it. <laughs> May God's grace be with you all even today. Amen. I'm thank you, Father.